Hello, and a very warm welcome to this conversation with Louise Casey. I'm Bronwyn Maddox. Before we kick off, which we're just about to do, some really brief housekeeping arrangements, which many of you will be very familiar with. We're going to be live tweeting from IFG events, this time using the hashtag IFG Corona. Um, still under that. Please follow along, do tweet along. Please do send in your questions for Neil as early as you like. Um, and we'll be moderating those. And if you give your name, where you're viewing from, we always like to see that. It really makes a difference to, to know that. You can post your questions in the panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll have a video and sound recording on our website within 24 hours. Um, actually, my team can tell me if that's not the right hashtag, which it may not be. Um, and I will let you know right away. Let me just turn to introducing Louise Casey, but to many of you, that's that's really going to be superfluous. We're really glad to be having Louise here to have this discussion today because the questions that she has been talking about for much of her professional life on social welfare are very live. You could say that at really pretty any, any time, I guess, but it really is so today. And in fact, right at this point, the Prime Minister is having his press conference on the funding of health and social care. And we'll be touching on that as well, many uh, among many things. Um, she has um, touched on many, many things, as I said, many roles within uh, a career looking at this. She's the chair of the Institute of Global Homelessness, a brand new crossbencher uh, in the House of Lords, and she's held roles at the Rough Sleepers Unit, the Antisocial Behaviour Unit, the Respect Task Force, the Troubled Families Programme, and reviews uh, at Rotherham, Rotherham Council and into community cohesion and extremism. And she spent last year some time on the Rough Sleeping Task Force, one of the things that was really um, referred to a lot at the beginning of the pandemic. So Louise, really warm welcome to the Institute. Thank you. Really pleased to be here. A rare appearance for me, Bronwyn. It is, it is. I'm conscious <laughs> of that. And I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And at this time, which is particularly highly charged. So let's Let's start where we are at the moment, mm. um, which is in the um, the pandemic, uh, people beginning to be more optimistic. We've had almost 18 months of this extraordinary change to everyone's lives, professional and personal. Where has that left uh, people, the kind of people you've been working with, the poorest people in the UK and the kind of questions you've been facing? Well, I mean, it is fascinating that we're having this conversation just at the moment that the Prime Minister uh, Rishi Sunak and Sajid Javid are actually making announcements about new spending um, which is you know a first since 2010 and obviously unlocks their manifesto commitment the, the triple lock on not raising taxes not raising uh, national insurance not breaking the pension deals so it's quite a phenomenal day actually to be able to talk about uh, the types of changes that I think we need for the 21st century, not just for uh, the rest of this parliament and, and not only to get us out of the pandemic. And I think sort of moving to what you actually asked me about is the fact that I think the pandemic has shown and has brought right into vision the sort of cracks that we already knew were there. So we've known and, you know, is repeated throughout the media and the briefing over the weekend that the issue of social care and funding for people, both um, you know, adults with learning difficulties and disabilities, which is not often talked about, as well as people mm. as we move into our latter age, that actually the funding for that is inadequate. We also have known for a long time, in my view, that the actual delivery of that work, which obviously won't be discussed today, but um, is vital uh, in my view, which is it's a flawed system, the social care and the health system. It, it doesn't add up to me. Um, and of course, if you're coming to the people that are sort of the, the cohorts of people I you know, care about and try to do something about, yeah. uh, obviously people who are poor and people who are low income are disproportionately affected by all of these things. So, you know, the Marmiot stuff um, is absolutely clear. You live in a deprived area, your life expectancy is a lot shorter. You can dress up in healthy years or you can dress up in life expectancy. Whichever way you look at it, whichever way you cut that evidence, you do not live longer if you are poor. 
And um, you know, there's something there which connects the announcement today with where I think we are uh, as a country. And, and I think the other thing which, you know, I'm sitting here in, in, in my office stroke bedroom, um, don't forgive the mess. And, um, you know, there is just something about the fact that many people have been away from the streets, as it were, away from loads of people, including social workers, community workers, lots of people pulled away from frontline work and lots of policy makers weren't up close to it. And I think we have failed to see the size of the enormity of what the pandemic A has shown and B has created. And finally, I'll shut up in a second, Bronwyn, sorry, I literally... No, 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 you're giving me lots of things to talk about. So, yeah. I've decided to speak, it's like confessional, I feel like I'm, you know, live it's saying pouring everything. Out. Yeah. Pouring out, I've declined interviews for the, about the last three weeks over these issues and now I'm, I'm here. But I think, you know, just what's really interesting about it is, of course, what does what does the government now do um and and actually just making a financial announcement great i would argue that if they do that through a straight national insurance like you know torsten bell like many other better cleverer people than me the ifs you bronwyn everybody will be saying this is this is this is essentially taxing people and not taxing the right people i agree with that but we have to declare one tiny victory today for, for, for the people who are poor in this country, which is the government has realised it needs to spend more money. Um, and, and that's okay. a small victory. I'm, go, oh, I'm going to come on to that point yeah. about money and stuff. Uh, let me just say, because I, I, I was uh, just, just saying to everyone watching, I, I was going to tell you the correct hashtag and Neil and our IFG team um, uh, tell me it's IFG Casey. Um, we can probably work these ones out uh, ourselves, but thank you very much indeed for the, the, the tweets that are coming. All right, Louise, th thanks for that um, introduction. You give me lots of different ways to go there. Let me actually start with one of them. The, 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 the UK government has obviously been central in all this. The different parts of the UK have run this, you know, ha have run the responses to a pandemic differently. Do you feel that that has led to very different um, uh, tactics and and results for uh, for people in 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 these kind of questions. I think the one of the most uh, extraordinary takeouts of uh, the, the the last eighteen months is I think pre pandemic most people you know to be blunt thought that you know Nicola can now decide what time we go to a pub in Scotland and that might be different to what time I go to a pub in in England. Yeah. Uh, you know, Mark Drakeford is now somebody whose name everybody knows, um, you know, being brutal. Um, you know, all of a sudden people have realised that things are different. And actually Wales said don't come in for a bit and Scotland said don't come over. And actually, I think it's really, really brought home the difference in the four principalities and the fact yeah. that they all are different. Within that, though, I think there's a really difficult thing for particularly Whitehall policymakers is Scotland is about the same size, if not smaller, than the county of Yorkshire. The county of Yorkshire has a population of five million. The, count, uh, the, the principality, the nation of Scotland, has a, 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 a population of five million in the old census stats of 2011. Mm. And what we know is Scotland has a disproportionately more loud voice in terms of UK politics than anybody living in Yorkshire. So not for now, but going forward, I think there has to be a kind of reckoning really about what's fair. Um, the, the same way that even if you took subsidies away per capita, people in Scotland on social care and in Wales, and I don't know this in Northern Ireland, so I'm not going to speak for that, but the per capita amount of money spent on social care is a great deal more than we spend on people in England. Now, some of that is choice about the devolved nations. Some right. of it is because they have more liquid money to do that and they have more choice. And some of it is, it, it may be because they have more older people, very, very, very marked factor in, in Wales. I, I know, and I can refer you to all kinds of IFG reports on this. We, we, we're publishing a lot on devolution and, and the finances of it. But I'm, I'm really interested in your take about whether, um, whether any of them handled this better. Oh, well, I mean, on homelessness, which is one of my core activities, I think that, to be honest, at the beginning, and the numbers in, in England, are so, they were so high. I mean, in, in, in the sort of decade from 2010 to, to 2020, the numbers of people sleeping rough on any given night was in the sort of 5,000. I mean, that's really high. And those numbers never got there in places like Wales, certainly not Northern Ireland and, and Scotland. So I think in some ways, I mean, it, 
you know, that in a way is is for me more when the inquiry comes, yeah. Yeah. they look at the differences of opinions. I don't have a, a strong view on that from here. I think what I do have a strong view on, which is devolution is now on the map. And I think that as fiscal changes, you know, more, more devolution and more powers are handed over. I think that there's a bit of a kind of so where does leave where does that leave the people of Yorkshire? You know, and where does that leave the people of London? Uh, London, of course, having a huge population and actually not voting in, often in the same ways as 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 the rest of mm. England. So I think those are the things that will will create um, both opportunities and challenges going forward. Mm. Can, I one, can I can I can I just sorry go on, go on if you've got something you're burning to say please yeah. please say it. The, the thing I wanted to say before we knew what was happening today, as, as it were, so the, the thing that I think is just like, I, I've never come across this in my entire career, and I've, I've worked in, in public services in Westminster in, in policy now for a long time, longer than my dyed hair um, uh, gives, gives, uh, gives it. But, you know, if you, if you look at the figures from last year, I, I do this regularly. So we had 400,000 people made redundant between March and October last year. That was more than the 2000 and 2000, sorry, 2008, 2009 recession. So that's extraordinary. We doubled the number of people on universal credit from 3 million to 6 million. If you add the people that are never talked about, the people on what's called legacy benefits, i.e. Uh, health benefits or people that hadn't been transposed uh, trans across to universal credit, that's a further, I think, two million. Um, we've got, and I think furlough is one of the most interesting things and the most positive things that we have done as a country to deal with difficulty. We've still got 1.9 million people furloughed as of now. The three million that the Public Accounts Committee accepted were excluded and should have got support. Then you're looking at 13 million people without me even adding on stats from the voluntary sector and from campaigning organisations. 13 million people out of a population of 66 is a big percentage. You're looking at 20 percent. If you, you mean add, of, of people at the moment not working at, at the moment who are either not working, furloughed, made redundant. I mean, those numbers are big. And I think that we if we add to that people that we know have been forced into debt, the argument I am trying to stack up here is you can't just walk away from this as government. You can use the fact this has happened during the pandemic. You'll have everybody on the left saying this is about 2010. It's about austerity. It's about a decade of austerity. I think that that's, you know, there's a very strong argument in that. I believe that. But you can gift this particular administration the fact that, you know, this was a pandemic. This wasn't their choice. This wasn't an Osborne choice or a Cameron choice. This is the pandemic. So we could choose, which is what they're doing today on social care, to draw a line in the sand and say, do you know what? We're going to take a look at poverty and welfare in the UK. We're going to think about the new three million on universal credit who have never been in the benefit system before. We're going to think about furlough. Furlough is a keep people in work package rather than give them the least amount of money you can possibly give them and you know send them to a food bank universal credit and you can start to see how you could create a much more positive uh, something for something welfare state and I think that's where when I said to Laura Kingsburg in October you know I, I, last year I wish that they would think about you know I use the word beverage but a, a kind of new moment where actually you could think what type of country do we want and the thing about all of this, and I'll shut up in a second, is that I feel a lot of the sort of left and the liberal left need to think that actually the welfare state worked because it was something for something that when, you know, Louise in Redco was struggling, Louise in London knew that she would help her. The same way when Louise in London is struggling, Louise in Redco knows to pay. But actually it's, it's a reciprocal, uh, it's a reciprocal, it's not rich people give to poor people because they should. It's a sense of, do you know what? We had a disease. We had to put millions of people on furlough. We didn't want them and their families to go to the wall. We didn't want them to uh, lose their jobs completely. We put a wage benefit in place that got them through the pandemic. And I think, yeah. you know, I think you, you've got to see this as an opportunity to do things very, very differently 
Right. Rob, so listen, listen, I I I want to capture some of these these excellent points uh, here. Um, and on your thirteen million, you look. Uh, for, forgive me, I would have to sit down with um a uh, uh, pen which I've got uh, and 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 dates because. One of the things I think it's important to remember is it, it is a very fluid situation. You've got people, uh, we've got furlough in its last moments now, but you've got parts of the economy, at least, parts yeah. of the country coming back very strongly are going to be taking those people back into work. Um, you have parts of the country crying out for jobs. It may not be the jobs that people were in before, but whether in hospitality or in agriculture and so on, somebody saying, you know, or construction, how can we get, how can we get labor top to bottom? Um, so you've got, you do you do have a lot of change at the moment. Whether at this point that adds up to the numbers of people uh, you, you said, I'm not, I'm I'm not sure, but I I, I, I happily um, take your figures into the, this conversation. Um, so you've talked about a beverage moment uh, using this incredible change, using the fact that the government and the country was willing to pour a lot of money into the support of people over these uh, last eighteen months, which I, th I think you, you've captured that very well. You talked about, you know, is, is this a moment for changing some of the big things? I think it's a really interesting point the, the words, you know, a beverage moment are absolutely have been used for 18 months in the in the cabinet office as, as you know, it, it, is this a point of change? So let's 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 just look at some of the specifics of what you would like to see changing coming out of this. Uh, we're at a point of change. I said the furloughs ending. Um, let me take one of the most obvious ones, the universal credit 20 pound uplift, uh, 20 pounds a week um, uh, extra uh, for those not immersed in this or watching from other countries, 20 pounds a week extra. The government is saying, no, that is going to end. Um, I think I can probably guess your view on it, but what is your view? Well, I think what's really interesting about it is that um, I, I saw uh, uh, the Resolution Foundation, which is an organisation I so admire and respect because they, their, their data and their analysis is so clear. But I thought it was interesting that they were pu putting out the fact that this will be the biggest cut since 1933 or something like that. And that there is this sense really that because it was put in place, it's now being cut. And I think what's what's interesting about that is, of course, I don't want a reversal in, in, in that. Um, but I actually think that that's a kind of important thing we leave in place whilst we consider what we're doing with our welfare benefits and our welfare state, that actually, I also think that you will have public support for withdrawing it. I think there is, you know, I, I have to be honest about the country that we live in, that people like the fact that people work their way out of poverty, that they, they don't like handouts. Um, and mm. the sense really that you always have to hand out to other people or else you're a bad person, that when you look at the polling, it's clear that people and other research that on the whole, we're not, we're, you know, when when uh, uh, George Osborne went for the welfare benefits, people didn't think that was a terrible thing. So we've just got to be realistic where we are. And I think a lot of people think, well, OK, we had a tough year, we gave them more benefit, job done. And, and I think that the 74 percent support we saw for that in January will be less. I mean, it gave this golden moment, January uh, 2021, when there was support from the public for that uplift. But I think we need not to be naive. And also, I think that actually that is not enough, Bronwyn, that, and I don't mean around the money. I just think we fundamentally have not got universal credit right. To be fair to people like Philippa Stroud, who was one of the uh, architects of universal credit, mm -hmm. what they wanted to create was a system that absolutely enhanced and moved people towards work. It's essentially yeah. you, you stop right. all of So is, is your objection to the amount of money offered on universal credit? And people might say, and in fact do say, look, it is pretty low by international standards. So that would be an argument against the level of it. Or is your argument about the system, which, as you said, in, in, in the way it's architects and in, in the beginning that did have very much cross party support. Uh, the the intention was to produce a simpler system that could get money to people uh, more quickly, which in fact we saw on the pandemic it did do, and, and that would urge people towards work. So, which where among those I'm features impressed. of I'm universal impressed. credit are your I'm, biggest objections? Well, I think that we need a we need to come back to the revolution that we want around welfare support to people, and I think that the the the, the push. I mean, there are three million people who've been on universal credit this year. That's a huge number for DWP, uh, Department of Work and Pensions, to process. 
because universal credit is a simpler system, it meant that they could do it, Bronwyn. Um, if, we'd back, if we'd been back in the old system, that would have been a lot harder. But fundamentally here, we have a, a rate that we hand out to people that is lower than 1990. You know, that is just not workable. That, you know, one of the, the gifts of the pandemic, which is an awful gift, is the growth of food banks and, and the growth of our own internal aid. What I'm suggesting is, you know, I thought to myself when I was thinking about this and actually talking to some conservative colleagues, uh, MPs, which is why don't we look at why we don't think of a support system where we furlough people almost for six months? So we, instead of cast, casting people into a world where actually they're in debt, remember 64% of people go into debt the minute they enter universal credit. You know, people literally have no money. They, uh, they have a basic income that's at 1990 level. You are pushing them further and further away from work. Let's be blunt. People can't pay their rent, that their, their lives fall apart, they can't get clothes. So instead of keeping them steady and making them think about how they get back into work, um, we essentially push them further. And that's not what they intended. I mean, that's not what's behind it. And I think we could look at sort of a wage package for six months or 12 months that gave people enough to get themselves back going again. So I just think, I'm not saying that's a solution, Bronwyn, but if I was sat in the Institute of Government, uh, more importantly, if I was sat in DWP or yeah. number 10 or the Cabinet Office, and I was serious about levelling up and serious about a new way of looking at Britain, I'd be having a new way of looking at our welfare benefits. So of course, I'll take the 20 right. quid. I'll fight against that being taken away, but it won't cut the mustard when you're actually trying to create a new welfare state and a new welfare state that's reciprocal. So I give in and I can take out, which we've lost some of that chat. And we've lost some of that talk in the last sort of 30, 40 years. Let me ask you one specific about, about homelessness, because I mean, what we've been talking about is, um, and you, you, you're not the, uh, uh, by any means, as, as, as we all know, uh, the only one making this point that, that there's a case for the £20 up list staying. Uh, that, that's, that's, um, that's an enormous amount of money uh, for, for, for the country, the stuff that's being announced today about health and social care, a lot of money. What about um, homelessness and the kind of things that the government did right at the beginning of the pandemic, changing its, its sort of approach to homelessness? What do you think of those? And are they things that are big money or are they things that actually are a different way of doing something? OK, j j just because I can't help myself, from and I'll come to homelessness in a second. A, it's not a lot of money if you compare it to what the government has done around things like business rates. If, if you look at, the, you know, I don't think that that's a lot of money in the scheme of things. More importantly, what? Uh, universal credit or are we talking about homelessness? Credit. Hang on, the universal credit. I just want to say about the universal credit. The other thing to remember about people when you put them on universal credit is they, they, can't, they can't pay to wash their clothes. They, uh, you know, with more than one or two children, they're going to end up homeless. They uh, don't have enough to look like they need to look on a call like this when they're going for a job interview. They can't put food on their children's tables. That stops them benefiting from this great, wonderful new load of jobs that we've got. Do you see what I mean? It's like, I think people think that that's a doable amount of money. And if you take the £20 away, and even in some families with the £20, it inhibits them from actually being part of the change that we want. It pushes them further away. So I think we just need to be cognizant that it's the, the, the 20 pound uplift, for me, I'd leave it in place whilst I reviewed the entire system. That's what I would do. I'd leave that till I have a plan on getting Britain out of its right. wealth as a whole. All right, and as we are still on this, uh, Mark at Rash, uh, Marcus Rashford has, has tweeted, um, um, uh, he's certainly behind the, the, the keeping the £20 uplift, but he says as well we should be focusing efforts on developing a sustainable long-term roadmap out of th what he calls this child hunger pandemic. Um, are you with him on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the issue for me is that I actually think that we ought to think of how do we no longer need uh, food, food, food kitchens and food banks. So if you were, if I was back working for Tony Blair, um, or Gordon Brown, I'd be doing a classic New Labour thing, which is saying, let's work out how we end the need for food banks. And actually within that problem will, will be some very difficult issues as well. Like some people do become, you know, nobody will like me saying this, but the truth is, I'm, I'm sorry, I've worked with, the, with this and I understand this world, I come from a bit of it. 
you know, there is a welfare dependency. People do get um, caught up in the misery of being poor and then they end up hopeless in terms of trying to get themselves out of it. So I think that if you set yourself a target on ending the need for food banks and worked back from that, that would be a very challenging thing uh, to do and the right way of using it. And I think that I think that my worry about what we are creating is that when MPs are of this government and actually saying, what a great job I'm doing, I've gone along to my local food bank and I support them and I've given them a load of shoes, you think, actually, wouldn't you be better as the government of the day thinking about how instead of running a um, you know, a, a food aid as if we are a, uh, as if we are you know, India or, you know, as if we're a, a, instead of being a developed country and the sixth richest country in the world, you're going off celebrating setting up of food banks. I'm sitting there thinking, how do I get those families not to lose their jobs? If they lose their jobs, how to get them back in those jobs? And whilst they're in that process, how do we make sure their kids still go to school and they don't end up homeless? And that's a very different approach to celebrating the need for yeah. food banks. Now, Marcus Rashford is and, no, and look, I, I, I take, sorry, what were you saying about Marcus Rashford? No, he isn't doing that. And I think that, you know, yeah. it, but it does take something, doesn't it? That you've got Marcus Rashford, who is a footballer, whose day job is a footballer, is actually leading the charge uh, on this issue. And he, you know, and I thank God, thank God that he did, particularly in the run up to the free school meals debacle. Uh, in fact, the day last October was disappointing. I mean, for One Nation Conservatives and, and, and for Labour to have that type of debate in the chamber when we are midway through a pandemic and we're talking about preschool meals for children, it's like, where are we in this country? It's like we can do better than this, regardless of where, who's Downing Street. Where do you think Labour as the opposition ought to have been at that point? Well, you know, it's really interesting you ask me that. As a policy wonk that's been in Whitehall for 20 years, I did wonder, uh, as a non-politician, actually calling an opposition day debate would just make the Tories deep into their trenches, and and it did. So, rightly, they, they, they called an opposition day debate, it was debated in Parliament, but in a funny kind of way, in the world of politics, if you attack the people, they then retrench and get firmer, and, you know, so... It was the right thing for Labour to do. I understand why they did it, but in a way, it just sealed it sealed mm -hmm. the, the government yeah. in place position. So, from a policy wonk perspective, and I was if I was back in, you know, an organisation that was worried about getting to the end result rather than how we got there, I was like, oh God, kid, you have to do that. Having said that, he has to be the opposition of the day, and what the government was doing was wrong, and the opposition of the day took that view. Um, but, you know, in the end of the day, uh, we managed to keep preschool meals going. Um, but again, even preschool meals don't get me on the delivery of preschool meals. It's like so go, we've, we've got a loose end back there. And I really I really do. <laughs> I really do want your view on the government's approach to homelessness, particularly at the beginning of this pandemic, trying to get people off the streets very quickly, obviously because of fears of, of, uh, of the virus, but the f fears for their for their health and so on. Were there things uh, that were done then that should be preserved because we're talking in all of this uh, not just about about money but about things uh, changes that have happened during the pandemic some of which we're saying you know or you're saying should be reversed but some of which you know might represent changes you want to hold on to and I just I would love given how much you've done on homelessness I would love your view on that. Well I think that I mean I'm obviously sub this is a subjective view because I was right, right in the middle of it all um, but I found it. Oh, it's, I, it's your it's, it's your view. I mean, it's, it's yeah. very much what we want. And, and I found it. So basically, I I've been working on homelessness internationally since I left Whitehall two or three years ago. And um, I came back and uh, was sort of saying, look, the numbers are too high. You, you've got a problem here, which is the, the issue, particularly in London, Bronwyn. But it's the same in actually Glasgow. It's the same in uh, Cardiff. And it's the same in Birmingham, Manchester, and some of the other large conurbations. Is that, as I said to Rob Jenrick, it's not just your numbers that you should be worrying about. This predates the pandemic, but it's who's out. So who's out? And the really difficult thing is if you look at the data, the chain data, the data in London, 
shows you that people, the largest problem, uh, challenge, sorry, is people have been out for more than two years. Now, people who've been on the streets for more than two years are a very different uh, human being with challenges to somebody that's been out either for a short period of time or you prevent from being homeless. The kind of drug, alcohol and mental health issues are off the barometer. I think it's something like 88% of people on the streets of London who've been out for more than two years have very significant needs. So I think knowing all of that, when we came back, I thought what was liberating about the pandemic is essentially, you know, I was able to just say Robert Jenrick was 100% behind, we have to get everyone in. It's like, and at that point, of course, remember that we didn't know in March, April last year, all of the complexities of how the virus would be um, it, it, in some ways, some of the people sleeping on the streets might have been better outside. There, there's an irony. But at the time, yeah. I was hell bent, as, as, as were all of us. We were liberated by the fact we had this terrible thing happening, which we could respond to, called the pandemic, which meant we were able to get everyone off the streets. And uh, we also had a happenstance of a lot of hotels closing that were willing to reopen to house people off the streets. And, you know, the numbers dropped so significantly. You know, I had, I had Birmingham, the wonderful uh, lead member for housing in Birmingham, Sharon Thompson, and I were talking about the fact they had six on the streets in Birmingham. Yeah. And yeah. we were discussing whether to use enforcement to get them in. You know, that's how determined we, uh, we were. Yeah. But the other thing I discovered last year was just how bad the situation had got. So I had no real understanding of the, the use of communal night shelters. And when I say communal shelters, I mean church halls opening overnight for one night, then you move to another place, then another place. These aren't fixed shelters. Yeah. And I think that we it made my sort of the scales fell from my eyes when I realized that actually the problem was was much bigger. I was very aware and continue to be aware of the number of families in temporary accommodation. And I think that's a huge issue and the type of temporary accommodation that they're in. So the upside was, I think it showed what could be done when you're serious. I think it's really interesting that we're able to pull people in off the streets when there's a pandemic, but not when they're dying of heroin, dying of alcohol or a multiple uh, mental health issues, where we don't see that as something that we should go, crikey, we need to get these people in. The other thing I thought that was interesting uh, about uh, Louise, just uh, um, we could we could I mean with um, um, huge enthusiasm and energy talk about these things for a long time. We're racing through the time. There's a stream of terrific questions coming in. I'm just I'm just looking at those. And or also my uh, the IFG teams told me uh, absolutely as we were talking earlier uh, that the prime minister's announced a 1.25 percent increase in national insurance contributions on employers and employees. Um, to fund well what it's funding exactly is a very good question and, and what people are going to be debating particularly in parliament how much is going to the nhs how much is going to social care and so on um lots of other things i could ask you i want let, let's just some pick up some of these terrific questions coming in they're coming in from all over the place um let me um let me um pick up one from um siobhan um saying is the model of support wrong i.e it assumes those who need support have failed they're not educated don't work have too many children as opposed to one that sits, sits, sets out to lift everyone to a standard of living that is decent for all so she's, she's picking up on your point about you know what is the welfare system for well i mean on that i think it was really interesting actually uh going back in 2011 to uh, set up and run the Troubled Families Programme, as it was then called. Yeah. And I thought what was interesting about that is actually standards were set and that the, the job was to, to help people, not, not hinder, not enforce, not punish, but help people meet those standards, particularly getting their kids up and into school uh, for 90% plus of each term, i.e. bringing them up to the same standard that we would expect of any other parent. So, I think that Siobhan is right. I think that the most important thing is to lift, expect that people should work and work out how, what would help them work. You know, I've met many mums where actually they are just dealing with domestic violence and that's what's stopping yeah. them getting into work. Yeah. I've met other mums yeah. that actually have no money to spend on their teeth or their hair or anything that they can barely keep going and actually just spending money on that helps them. You know, it can go from really big systemic things to actually quite small things. 
From yeah. can I mention something and it's really important about today that the, the, the rough sleeping thing taught yeah. me last yeah. year is I think the thing I feel really strongly about about social care and health is what happened last year on rough sleeping and it was a bumpy road. I mean, I was on the phone to Jonathan Van Tan and Jenny yeah. on a fairly regular basis. And actually, we had to organise, particularly in London, health and homelessness to run in parallel. That was not straightforward yeah. at all. But there was an overarching determination to make sure we kept people as healthy as possible, which was the driver, and not to have them outside. And I think the, the biggest challenge once they've uh, worked out who they raised this money from and how it isn't just going to be punishing younger people is what system would you have of social care? And I still feel uh, we have the NHS is essentially the National Hospital Service. That's a pretty cruel cool thing to say, but everything around it is either preventing people mm. going to hospital or kicking them out so that they release a bed. And then we yeah. have social care. And the reform that we need, the fundamental reform we need is of the delivery of social care. And at the moment, it's a partnership between local authorities. So, you know, they all have nice names. It's the Department of Health and Social Care, isn't it? Well, it so is not. You know, it's like you've got these two fundamental things that are done so differently, where the yeah. local government budgets that have been slashed and slashed, you know, the biggest loser in austerity it accounts yeah, was 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 local government and well, uh, that had an effect of all kinds of uh, things particularly um particularly social care and if local governments look after that then all kinds of neighborhood services and so on um uh, got, got squeezed and 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 kind of it, it, I, you know less visible nationally sorry Louise is actually frozen on the screen for me. So I'm waiting. And it looks as if she was in real um, real flow on that one and about to come back on that. But let's just wait a moment and see if I'm hoping it's her internet on or our internet. Maybe the IFG team who would, um, if we were uh, all in the building together, as many of us are in the building, that would leap up at this point and tell me uh, where they thought the problem was. And they're saying, uh, thanks, Neil, they're uh, saying frozen for me too. Um, so we're going to have to, um, we're going to have to wait for uh, Louise frozen on our screens to come back with us. But thank you very much for the questions coming in. Let me just um, note some of them. I'm going to, the next one I'm going to take, if we can get Louise back, she's leaving and then she's now going to rejoin. All right, we're admitting her again. Louise, I think we've got you back again. Uh, you were frozen. Great, two thumbs up. That's definitely not a freeze. OK, let me um, let me use that as a as a pivot to just pick up another question uh, from Frances D'Souza, which again is very wide ranging. She's saying, is there any appetite for appointing a senior cabinet level minister to coordinate uh, uh, all aspects of child poverty? But this really speaks to, we've got quite a few questions, and I know we've got a lot of questions in the IFG as well, about what you think, how you think change in government comes about. You've talked um, in the context of Dominic Cummings and others about how the difference between people who can bring change uh, and those who just become overall um, too disruptive uh, for the change actually to have uh, real success. And I'm just wondering, what you felt and who you felt successfully brought about change, whether it was politicians, whether it was the officials, where someone has to be. You've been in government, yeah, you know, working within Whitehall, you've been outside, you know, we're, all, we're talking about change in this. Where should you put these people? What kind of people in order to get change for these things? Well, um, I mean, I think the, the truth of the matter is governments have to pick uh, the the particular issues that they want to do something about and what you need across government and you know this is you and I talking to each other we've known each other for a long time uh, in Whitehall that actually you need most government departments to keep moving things on to keep making changes but if a government wants to do something to be to quote uh, sort of the Alistair Campbells of this world eye-watering or you want to create seismic change then actually you do need from the prime minister to a senior cabinet member to then sometimes czars um, which is the roles i've played where essentially you have a real determination centered on a particular issue so 
I've, you know, under Blair bringing down rough sleepers without having yeah. Blair and John yeah. Prescott behind that and Hilary Armstrong and a cross cabinet committee chaired by Hilary Armstrong and later Mo Molan, we wouldn't have got what we needed on. Right. So on you've described all kinds of things there. If you were just put in as a czar, it could be something like a prime minister wanting to badge it, just say, OK, we're really making a commitment to this. But you've actually described very quickly all kinds of things that give that real heft as well as force of personality within Whitehall and so on. You need the committees and you need the backing of the prime minister. You need the you real need backing the of the prime minister. minister uh, sometimes depend in the, in the Gordon Tony era, sometimes Gordon did the backing, but mainly you need a prime minister to choose and then you need a senior cabinet member and then you need a budget. It needs to be in the spending department. Czars on the whole come and go unless they're part of the system. You know, m many a prime minister just, you know, goes and finds somebody. I've met many of them. I'm sent to, in the old days, Jeremy Hayward asked me to go and talk to them. You know, they'd wander into yeah. Whitehall thinking they were going to sit at the right hand of the prime minister and make massive spending decisions. And actually they're window dressing. And so before, you know, what you need is the substance of Whitehall and politics lined up behind this. That's actually what social care needs. It's also what we need if we're going to lift the country properly out of the type of way I think we're badly running a welfare benefit system, which will trap kids particularly in poverty, rather than thinking big. Um, and that's where and I would- And so really, really briefly on, on Frances's question, um, um, what well she says, is there any appetite for appointing this? But do you think there should be uh, a senior, senior cabinet level minister or specifically on child poverty? Well, I think on poverty, so, so again, I'm, I'm not a subset person. I, I think that you could look at, if you just look at children, but don't look at the parents, if you don't look at the grandparents, yeah. if you don't look at the, you know, you have to look at family as a whole. Um, and within that, you get to children. Obviously, one cares and we should care very much about children because they are all our responsibility. But to transform children, you have to transform families, you have to transform schools, you have to yeah. transform, you know, getting a parent into a decent job that's got money on the table, um, yeah. it, that transforms child poverty. Uh, and so just handing out more money isn't going to solve it completely. Yeah. All right, thanks. We've got three minutes. I'm going to try and get in two questions. All right, the first one, if you summarise it, there's a debate going on between questioners on this, about your view of universal basic, basic income. Well, you see, I, again, I would throw universal basic income into the pot of what type of system do we want? What is our post-beverage welfare state? What do, you know, I, I would want to pause and look at that um, uh, and I would put it alongside a wage benefit. I'd like to look at furlough. I'd like to look at who came out of furlough well. I'd like to look at the three million people that are on universal credit. You know, it's a bit like I'm glad the government has made some announcements today, but if they'd paused and got it right, I'd be even happier. OK, thanks. And I'm going to bring in, I mean, just a last question from uh, Abbas. And he says uh, there are many people whose applications, I think he's talking about asylum, uh, are still running at the Home Office and they've been going on for more than a year and they get £39.63 a week for essential food, clothing, milk, laundry, travel, echo, everything. And uh, COVID increased this benefit by just 15 pence a week. Do you include them among your, your, your studies uh, on pockets of poverty? Look, I mean, look, 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 we are where we are. You know, one of the things about the Rough Sleepers job last year was it, it revealed, you know, a, a secret that the government didn't really want to know, which is we now have on in this aisle, in the British Isles, we have people living here. They're here. Either sort them out if you want to. If your policy says they shouldn't be here, make sure they're not here. But if they're here, we can't have, we currently have Afghan uh, refugees, they will become refugees, and a borough in London, a decent borough, that are living on 79p a day. If we say people can come here, let's get them up at it, speaking English, yeah. understanding our culture and working. And, and I think at the moment, the problem with the immigration system and the problem with the asylum system, not so much the asylum system, the asylum system is simply too slow. It's too cumbersome. Yeah. All of the immigration stuff is about poor delivery of a of a service and it serves nobody well. So we have people that shouldn't be here. We have these very, very, very long consideration, the backlogs of application consideration. And so finally, in our last minute, what 
do you think Britain could do to help the Afghans who are coming here, who are not asylum seekers and they're invited mainly with, with immediate right to, to work and so on? But in terms of integration and helping people get up and running in the country, what, what, how well, would you I was, solve that? I was in school when we had the Vietnamese boat people in mm. Baltimore, and uh, they were more than welcome into communities. They were adopted by families and um, th th they, they found their way to being equal and positive members of our community. And I think in terms of what, you know, the one thing we ought to get right, given how much we as a, as a world have got wrong in relation particularly to the women and children in Afghanistan, is that when they get here, we give them the safest birth we possibly can to be part of our society. And we've done it before. We did it with, with the, you know, from, from the Vietnamese boat people in my childhood to here today. We know how to do that stuff. And that's what we should be proud of in Britain. Instead of running ourselves down the whole time, actually, we do get some things right. We did get 5,000 plus homeless mm. people off the street. And we can receive people from Afghanistan and give them a decent start here in the UK. Well, with that, we're going to have to end. Um, Louise, thanks so much. I mean, this is, as you said, you've come out of um, comparative uh, quiet and silence, self-imposed, um, to talk about this huge range of issues. And there were many, many more in the excellent questions we've got streaming in. There were several points where I had to, I had to divert us because um, uh, I wanted to get on to more things, but we could happily have talked about any of those things for uh, another 45 minutes. So um, apologies uh, to those whose questions I couldn't get in. Huge thanks uh, to people watching and uh, who sent in the questions from all over the place. Um, still coming. And Louise Casey, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.